So I want to, the first thing I want to talk about is angular momentum. I want to talk about problem five from the test. Um, so, and the interesting thing about problem five is that there were actually, there are at least three different ways to solve this problem and people in this class actually found all three ways. <laughs> yes, so, what? Yes, we're going to go over all three because they actually tell us different things. So the, so the scenario is... <laughs> so, so we're... Um, in outer space, so we don't have to worry about gravitational forces. <coughs> um, a small steel ball hits a dumbbell which is rotating counterclockwise. <coughs> um, and then it bounces off. <coughs> and the question is, what's the final rotational angular momentum of the dumbbell? <coughs> and for that, you have to figure out whether it's still rotating this way or it's rotating that way. <coughs> so, so the first thing that I think some of you may have failed to do is actually just try to visualize this thing in your head. <coughs> so here's, here's a spinning dumbbell. We don't need this up anymore. <coughs> so here's a spinning dumbbell <coughs> and a steel ball comes in and hits it when it is conveniently vertical so that we don't have to deal with angles which is really nice, actually, in this problem. <coughs> and it bounces back. <coughs> so certainly, it's, if it keeps rotating this way, it's going to be doing it more slowly, or it could be rotating the other way, right? <coughs> but the information we need is both a magnitude and a direction. We need the final angular momentum. <coughs> so there really isn't any way out of using the angular momentum principle for this. So the momentum principle tells us about center of mass velocities, right? <coughs> and that may be useful. We, in one of these methods, you actually have to use the momentum principle. Um, the, uh, the energy principle, we do know about rotational kinetic energy, right? And that's related to angular momentum, so... <coughs> K rotation and is the magnitude of L squared over two times the moment of inertia. And so you got a little bit of credit if you tried to use just the energy principle because at least you were trying to invoke a principle that might give you some information. Now, there's a problem with applying the energy principle here, though. Do you see what it is? It doesn't give you a direction, that's one. So you can't, you can't get a direction, okay? You could maybe get a magnitude. But what do you have to assume in order to use energy here, Jonathan? Yeah, is the collision elastic? Because if it's not elastic, then some of the initial kinetic energy is going to internal energy. The dumbbells vibrating or getting hot or the, 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 the balls getting hot. And so if there's an internal energy change then we don't know what that is. It could be big, it could be small, and so we can't actually get the final, <coughs> even the magnitude of the final rotational angular momentum just from using energy. Now, if you tried to use energy, you got five points just because you actually tried to take a principle and apply it. Um, but but sort of rules of thumb for choosing principles, we need a direction and we have to think a little bit about whether collisions are, are elastic or not. So that's, 
so that makes this not a very good choice. So in the end, angular momentum pretty much has to come into this. So we're going to have to use <coughs> the angular momentum principle <coughs> in some form. Um, <coughs> and we'll write it this way. L final is L initial plus <coughs> the net torque, the net twist on the system acting over some time. <coughs> and exactly how we apply it depends on what we choose as our system and what we choose as the point around which we're going to calculate angular momentum. <coughs> so, uh, let's see. <coughs> So I actually wrote a little program. What? Why do I not have access to a program that's mine and I'm signed in? Let's try this again. Okay. So here's here's the the dumbbell, here's the the little steel ball, and the line is is just a vertical line so we can see where things are relative to the vertical. And so the ball comes in and it turns out that the the barbell is actually now rotating the other way. Okay, so initially <coughs> um, it's, it's rotating counterclockwise, but now it's rotating clockwise. And it's also moving because there was momentum exchange between the two objects also, right? <coughs> So, uh, so the first question is, what do we want to take as our system? <coughs> and the second question is, what do we want to take as the location around which we're going to calculate <laughs> angular momentum? Oh. Let's put some values up here. So the initial rotational angular momentum was zero zero five kilogram meters squared per second. Now there was some confusion in working this problem. Some of you were confused between angular momentum and angular velocity. So this is angular momentum. The units are kilogram meters per second squared. So omega is units of radians per second. So angular, angular velocity. What you're given is rotational angular momentum. So this is partly just reading the problem carefully. Um, <coughs> the mass of the ball is, I think, what was it, two? Two kilograms? Yes. Two kilograms. <coughs> Each of these things weighs 25 kilograms. This distance is 0 0.4 meters. <coughs> the initial vo velocity was 12 zero, zero meters per second <coughs> and the final was <coughs> 
<coughs> now that's not exactly that's not exactly how these things were given it it said initially it's traveling at a speed of 12 meters per second and then it's traveling at a speed in the minus x direction of of 8 meters per second <coughs> it's it's very tough to get all the directions right if you decide to work with magnitudes so if you're going to work with X components or something like that and you preserve signs, that's okay. I find it simpler just to write everything out as a vector because then I'm actually sure I've got the signs in the right place. Um, and so there was a lot of direction confusion. Uh, and I think, and it's initially at, so it's rotating around its center of mass, which is clearly there and it's initially not translating so it's the barbell is just spinning okay <coughs> so if you <coughs> if you visualize this <coughs> there are various things to account for um, <coughs> And if you, if you had trouble visualizing it, then you probably had trouble working the problem. <coughs> um, and this was by far the, the, the lowest <laughs> problem. All the other problems people did, almost everybody did really well on. This was by far the one that, that uh, <coughs> was the most challenging. So... <coughs> So the first solution is to take the system uh, is both objects. <coughs> and take the location <coughs> around which we're going to calculate angular momentum <coughs> at the center of mass of the barbell. So that's, that's location A. <coughs> and then we write out the angular momentum principle. And again, the, when you're we're starting from a fundamental principle, uh, the be both the best way to show your reasoning and the best way to track your reasoning is to actually start with that principle and then expand all the terms out. So if your paper is full of calculating this term and that term and that term and you don't get to a principle till down at the bottom, you often lose track of what you're doing. And so this is, this is a bookkeeping device too. So we write final angular momentum is initial angular momentum plus net torque. Since we've taken the system as both objects, we don't know of anything around that could possibly be exerting a torque on this system and so the net torque is zero. And that means <coughs> that the final angular momentum has to be equal to the initial angular momentum. And now the, the sort of thought piece comes because we have to identify all the terms that contribute to those things. <coughs> so the final angular momentum <coughs> clearly is the, the final rotational angular momentum of the bar well. That's what we're trying to solve for. So that, that piece is good. <coughs> Is there translational angular momentum here? Yeah, the, the, uh, the little ball coming in here <coughs> has some momentum. We'll say it's P initial. <coughs> and we can draw a vector r from from r location a to this <coughs> to this ball coming in <coughs> and therefore it has translational angular momentum relative to location a now this is this again this is one of these things that seems a little abstract it's traveling in a straight line why can it have rotation translational angular momentum and i think one of the ways to think about it is to think about a series of orbits. So if this were an object that were orbiting some location, 
it's going around, clearly it's got translational angular momentum, right? Not a problem. So we have P, we've got R. Well, what if its orbit was not round, but much more elliptical? That's a terrible ellipse, but we'll pretend it's a good ellipse. Okay, still going around, still translational angular momentum. Well, think about bigger and bigger and flatter and flatter ellipses till this one's almost a straight line. <clears throat> but we still have R cross P, we've still got some translational angular momentum. It's not a big step to actually moving <coughs> in a straight line and still having translational angular momentum relative to that location. Furthermore, we've seen that it has translational angular momentum in the sense that if it collides with something, it can make it spin. So it can transfer it. So, so you have to think something moving in a straight line has to have translational angular momentum. So we have some initial Translational angular momentum of the <coughs> of the ball, and we have the initial rotational angular momentum of the barbell. The initial oh, this is final. Sorry, it's the final side. Uh, <coughs> translational angular momentum of this the ball. And does the, does the barbell have any translational angular momentum in this final state? Well, let's see. So if we run this thing, so it certainly has some momentum now. So it's, here we are in the final state, it's, it's rotating, here's our location A, it's not there anymore. So it's got some momentum, but it's still lined up with this location. So that R cross P is actually going to end up being zero. So we cleverly chose a location about which to calculate our translational angular momentum <coughs> so that in a final state, this only has rotational angular momentum and not translational angular momentum. Questions? Okay. <coughs> okay. So now we just have to calculate these terms. <coughs> And so we have uh, the final rotational angular momentum, and we have the final translational angular momentum. So we need P final, which is 2 kilograms times <coughs> So that's R cross P final. <coughs> and that's going to be the initial rotational angular momentum, which we know, plus R cross P initial. <coughs> of the ball. How do we think about R though? We know this distance, this is just 0.2 meters, but we actually have absolutely no idea what this distance X is. <coughs> so how do we deal with that? So, <coughs> Charles is suggesting taking a different state 
where instead of calculating the angular momentum of the ball, there we calculate it when it's <coughs> here, just before it just before it collides with the barbell. Why is that okay? <coughs> well, it's okay because did the angular momentum of this ball change as it moved along here? Were there torques acting on it? There weren't any forces acting on it. There weren't any torques acting on it. So the angular momentum didn't change. So the angular momentum should be exactly the same. So that's legitimate, in which case R is equal to zero D over two meters and we can we can calculate it. Another thing we could have done though, which is worth thinking about, is we could have said <coughs> that here's R <coughs> and so we'll write it out as so we could have written out R is equal to X 0 0.20 meters. <coughs> and then we could have said, well, <coughs> the initial <coughs> translational angular momentum is X 0 0.20 meters cross <coughs> What's the initial initial momentum? Two kilograms times twelve, so twenty-four zero zero kilogram meters per second. <coughs> and we know that R cross P is going to be in the minus Z direction. So therefore, all we need to worry about is the Z component. We could work out the other components, but we don't really have to. <coughs> So it's going to be zero, zero, and let's see, it's going to be Rx Py minus Ry Px. <coughs> so that's zero, zero, x times zero minus <coughs> 24 times 0 0.2 so 0 0 it turns out this X doesn't matter <coughs> could have been anything and we get a minus 4.8 kilogram meters squared per second which is exactly what we would get if we use this So we have a zero, zero, oh this is initial, sorry. <coughs> so we have zero, five, zero, plus zero, zero, minus 4.8 kilogram meters squared per second. <coughs> And the same thing here, we can, we can just go ahead and use <coughs> use that for R if we want to. <coughs> so we have R cross P final, P final is going to be uh, Minus, so we have <coughs> is zero, zero point two zero meters cross a negative sixteen zero zero kilogram meters per second. 
and so we end up with uh, <coughs> if you work this out you're going to get a positive number <coughs> so we're going to end up with 0, 0, 3.2 kilogram meters squared per second <coughs> I think <coughs> Yes. Wait, <coughs> did I get that right? This should have been positive. Why did I get the wrong sign? Because <coughs> it's initially rotating this way. <coughs> so why is my sign wrong? Yes, yeah, so I definitely mean zero zero five, but that's not what I'm concerned about. <coughs> so initially, the initial angular momentum is oh no, it is negative. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> R cross P is negative, so that's right. And here we have <coughs> R cross P. That is po okay. The signs are right. <coughs> And so we just solve for the final rotational angular momentum and we get a zero, zero, minus three uh, kilogram meter squared per second. <coughs> right. So questions about that approach? <coughs> yes? Um, yeah, I think there probably is, and in fact, if we just, if we do a different solution, we're going to see that it, if we, if we just approach it slightly differently, we do end up with a non-zero translational angular momentum for the bar. So that, that's solution method three, so stay tuned. <laughs> <coughs> um, but the key thing is you kind of have to think about these things, and, and if you don't draw R, um, in each case, it's hard to think about. So, so diagrams are your friend. They're not, they're not a decoration that your teacher wants. Diagrams are something that help you, help you think about problems. I will post these solutions. You don't need to really write them. Okay. So we're good on that solution. Yes? Okay. So let's instead... <coughs> Start from the same principle, but this time we're going to actually take as a system the barbell. <coughs> but not the, not the ball. <coughs> so the ball is part of the surroundings. <coughs> In this case, the way we think about this is that <coughs> there is a torque. So, if the system's the barbell, the ball comes in and delivers a net angular impulse. So, tau delta t is angular impulse, just like f net delta t is impulse. <coughs> then make, that changes the angular momentum of the system. And so, our job is to calculate the torque. <coughs> or rather the, the impulse here. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, 
how would we do that? Well, <coughs> we don't know. We don't know the force that the ball exerts on the barbell. <coughs> but we actually do know <coughs> uh, the change of momentum of the ball. So if we know the change of momentum of the ball is F net delta T, the force on the ball, the, the F net delta T is the impulse delivered to the ball by the barbell. So for the barbell, we, we know that delta P ball plus delta P barbell is zero. So delta P barbell is F that's on the ball. <coughs> so the change of momentum of the barbell has to be equal to the net impulse applied to the barbell by the ball. Well, if torque <coughs> is the cross product of the, the vector from what point A to, to our object, cross F, then angular impulse is just going to be R cross <coughs> F net delta T. <coughs> so let's, let's, so we can actually calculate the impulse, the angular impulse applied to the barbell by the ball. Pick, we still have to pick a location A though. And we're still going to pick location A here at the where at the location where the center of the barbell currently is, although it may not stay there. <coughs> so we have um, so we're going to apply the momentum principle. <coughs> so Delta P is F net delta T. <coughs> and now we've got on the, for the ball. <coughs> so we have P final, which is negative 16, zero, zero kilogram meters per second minus P initial, which is 2400 zero, zero kilogram meters per second. <coughs> That's a negative 40 kilogram meters per second, and that equals <coughs> net force on the ball times delta T. Now some of you kind of were in this space but were incredibly sloppy about signs. <coughs> and so <coughs> if you get a positive 40 here, <coughs> you're in trouble. <coughs> so this means that, that the net, <coughs> net impulse on the barbell F net delta T is due to reciprocity. Remember the reciprocity lab where you saw forces were equal but op equal in magnitude opposite in directions when you did collisions. So this is going to be <coughs> a plus 40, zero, zero. Uh, <coughs> kilogram meters per second. <coughs> so we have final rotational angular momentum is initial rotational angular momentum, which is zero, zero, five kilogram meters squared per second plus 
tau net delta t. Well, what's what's r cross f net delta t? That's going to be equal to zero zero point two zero meters cross forty uh, zero zero kilogram meters per second. <coughs> Again, we were worried about Z components. <coughs> so we have zero, zero, <coughs> Rx, which is zero times Py, which is zero, minus Ry, which is zero point two, times Px, which is forty. <coughs> And so we're going to get zero, zero, minus uh, eight, right? <coughs> 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 This is kind of an elegant approach, actually. Henry did this. That was a. It was a. It's a very nice solution. Um, <coughs> so it's a very different way of thinking about it, and you do have to use two <coughs> principles, but. It's actually less calculation in a certain sense. It's 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 a nice it's a it's a very nice approach. <coughs> Questions about this one? <coughs> okay, we got one more. And I don't know if we need to go through it all in totally gory detail, <coughs> but so we're back to using both things as the system, but we pick a different location A. <coughs> so in this case, what we do is we pick location A to be at the center of the top, at the, at, at the location where the center of the top ball of the barbell currently is. Why would we do that? But well, what's the initial translational angular momentum of this ball if we pick this location? It's zero, isn't it? And the final angular momentum of that ball is going to be zero, too. So we're, we're done with that. <coughs> so what we've got is only the initial rotational angular momentum, which we know. The final rotational angular momentum which we're trying to find out and then there is one more there's now one more component of angular momentum because as this barbell moves so here's our location A and now our barbell is rotating but it's also moving away uh, Sorry, here's location A. So we actually now have <coughs> translational angular momentum for the the barbell. So <coughs> So we know this, we need this. 
This is the only thing we actually have to calculate. <coughs> We've calculated the, we know the momentum of the barbell because since the change in momentum of the, the ball was negative 40, zero, zero kilogram meters per second, then the momentum of the barbell has to be uh, the initial <coughs> momentum of the, <coughs> the initial momentum of the ball plus the final momentum of the ball and the final momentum of the barbell have to add up to, have to be the same. So, um, <coughs> so the momentum argument <coughs> We still, we still have to use the momentum principle here. <coughs> so, system, both things, P final is P initial plus zero, <coughs> is 2400 kilogram meters per second. <coughs> We have the ball's final momentum is a negative 16 so kilogram meters per second plus <coughs> final momentum of the barbell, right? <coughs> and so that does indeed to come out to be <coughs> 40, zero, zero kilogram meters per second. <coughs> now, now, what is R in this case? We'll, we'll, we'll take Charles's approach and take it just, just after the collision, so nothing has shifted very far yet. <coughs> the ball has just collided with the barbell and is, is uh, starting to go back. Um, <coughs> Okay, so nothing's, nothing's moved very far. So the, and the barbell, let's draw the barbell is nearly vertical in this case. So here's location A. We're talking about the, the total momentum of the barbell. We're talking about its center of mass being the location we think of the momentum. So here's the momentum. So. So R in this case is actually going to be 0 minus 0 0.20 meters. <coughs> and so we've got a 0 minus 0 0.20 meters cross <coughs> 40, zero, zero kilogram meters per second plus Final rotational angular momentum is zero zero five. <coughs> and if we work it out unsurprisingly, <coughs> we get problem because there's more than one way to think about it. <coughs> yeah. Which would you say is like the best way to go about shooting or how to choose the best one? Which is the best one? I actually think they're all good. Um, <coughs> this is this is I think the least obvious. <laughs> um, <coughs> the I think the most straightforward is the way we did it first, where we take <coughs> the barbell plus the ball as the system and take location A as the s where the center of mass of the barbell is right now. <coughs> um, and it's in a certain sense slightly simpler in that you don't need to invoke the momentum principle. You just, you're just careful tabulating terms for angular momentum. But they're all <laughs> they're all good. There isn't there isn't the best way. <laughs> There's um, 
in a in a in a rich system there's more than one way to think about it usually the the trap in using energy is um, that people tend to forget that collisions mostly are not elastic and so that's that's also I don't think you would have gotten the direction right oh yeah I put a graph of energy in just to <coughs> So let me uh, okay, so let's so here is it's a very non-elastic collision, as you can see, given the so that was the this was the initial kinetic energy. here's the final kinetic energy of the so uh, so assuming the collision was elastic was not a great assumption. <laughs> yes. We kind of think of this as intelligent plug and chug. You write down one of the three principles. It tells you what things to evaluate. You evaluate them, and you get a result. And this is maybe the easiest with the energy principle because it's all scalar, but it's still the same thing. It just it's a guide. It tells you what to do. So, really, computers don't like me this week. My cursor keeps disappearing. There, now it's there. Okay. Okay. So, since we're talking about rotation, <coughs> let's think about this for a minute. <coughs> so we've got two disks sliding on a surface with extremely low friction, like an air hockey table or something like that. <coughs> and they're both being pulled with exactly the same force. One of them is... <coughs> uh, One of them, however, has a, a string just anchored at its center, and the other has a string wrapped around it, so as you pull, the string unwraps. Okay? <coughs> so, think about, try to imagine what you're going to see here. <coughs> so, you pull for three seconds. Exactly the same force on each. Which one goes farther? <coughs> okay, talk to each other for just a minute. Okay, what's the answer? Okay, well, it's not quite unanimous. <coughs> Most people are saying two. Some people are asleep. <laughs> one person's saying one. <coughs> okay, fine. <coughs> so, you, uh, so it seems like the second one should move farther. Now, start over and apply the momentum principle. <coughs> okay? So, you had your gut reaction, now apply the momentum principle.
So what does the momentum principle tell us? Yeah, the momentum principle says they should move the same distance, doesn't it? Because if delta P <coughs> is F net delta T, change in momentum, same force applied to each one for the same time, so the change in momentum ought to be the same for each time interval, so by three seconds they should be have they should be going the same speed at every point, so they should move the same distance. That's really odd. Is the momentum principle wrong? Um, is it, how do we think about this? So let's actually see if we can, uh, there. <coughs> simulate it. So here is <coughs> whoops, let's try that again. Okay, so here's a program <coughs> that's just kind of modeling this system. <coughs> So the one at the bottom has the string attached in the middle. <coughs> and so we're going to let it go, okay? So this agrees with what you predicted with the momentum principle in the sense that they end up in the same place. But there is something different, isn't there? What's different? Yeah, the top one's rotating, so the momentum's the same, but is their energy the same? No, it's not. <coughs> Which one has more energy? The top one, because it's not, it only, it doesn't just have translational kinetic energy, but it has, <coughs> rotational kinetic energy. <coughs> what else is different? <coughs> so imagine that you are you're the you're the you're pulling these, okay? So so Alice and Alice and Bob are pulling these things. Okay, so a little yellow dot is somebody's hand. <coughs> So they exert, Alice and Bob, Alice is the top one, Bob is the bottom one. Alice and Bob exert the same force for the same time, but whose hand moved further? One. Yeah, Alice's, Alice's hand moved further. Who did more work? Alice actually did more work because, but this is interesting because we have to be very careful about our definition of work here. <coughs> Because if we say, and the quest, so work is <coughs> force times displacement, right? Force times displacement, Fx, so in this case, <coughs> now the question is, what displacement are we talking about? If we say that the displacement delta R is the displacement of the center of mass of the object, that's the same. <coughs> so if we say <coughs> so that'd be <coughs> that's the same. If we say that it's the force times the displacement of the point application of the force, they're different because Alice's hand moved farther. And these two expressions are both useful, but they give us different information. 
if we calculate work as this force F times the distance the center of mass moved. <coughs> so, <coughs> so F X times What are we going to get? That's going to be right for one of them, isn't it? It's going to be right for the bottom. So that must give us the change in translational kinetic energy. <coughs> if we take <coughs> if we take Fx delta x of the hand <coughs> That's a, that's a lot more work. That must be delta K translational plus delta K rotation. So this is like modeling the system as a point particle. So Superman comes along it down to a point particle it can't rotate <coughs> and so if we take the net force applied to the distance the, super, the center of mass moves we get the change in translational kinetic energy because that's all it can have <coughs> if on the other hand we say this is not a point particle it's what we'd call an extended system and we take the force applied times the distance that point of application of the force really actually moves then that's the amount of energy that was put into the system for real and it must be not only the change in translational kinetic energy but the change in relative energy, energy relative. <clears throat> so depending on how we model, and of course if we wanted to get K rota delta K rotational for this, all we have to do is calculate this. We get that, so it's a way of... <clears throat> now this is, an, this is actually an interestingly powerful way of doing things that, that's um, it's actually a little unfamiliar. People don't usually talk about it, but it's just just elementary physics. Um, now it can be extended a little bit. So, so suppose you had an object that was deformable, and you exert F1 here and F2 here and F3 here. <coughs> well, <coughs> the change in translational kinetic energy is going to be <coughs> F1 plus F2 plus F3 <coughs> times the displacement of the center of mass, the dot product of the force and the displacement of the center of mass. <coughs> but the change in the total energy <coughs> change in total energy is F1 times delta R1, the distance that this point moved. So if you stretched, you stretched a spring here, plus F2 times delta R2. <coughs> and by doing, by modeling the system two ways, by modeling it first as a point particle, we can find out change in translational kinetic energy. Then we model it as the full extended system and we find the change in total energy. By the difference, we can find out something about the change in what we're going to call internal energy to the system. 
<coughs> so let's see if we can just apply this a little bit. Uh, so I want So you just have a spring, like the ones you had in lab. You hold it in your hands and then you just pull. <coughs> Did the kinetic energy of the spring change? Did the translational kinetic energy of the spring change? Okay. What's the change in the total energy of the spring here? <coughs> You're exerting, each hand is exerting a force of five newtons, and each hand moves uh, um, one centimeter. <coughs> okay, talk to somebody. You look puzzled, so let's work it out. <laughs> okay, <coughs> so we have <coughs> so we've got, uh, so let's start with the left hand, so that's um, a minus five newtons in the x direction times minus 0.01 meters. And now we have the right hand, which is a plus five newtons in the x direction times a plus. 0.01 meters. <coughs> so what was the total work done on this real system? Really? Minus 5 times minus 0.01 is... What's it? Yeah, that's right. So it's 0 0.10 joules, because this is a positive number. And that makes sense, right? You expended energy stretching the spring, didn't you? And this end moved and that end moved. Okay, so the change, so the change in the energy of the spring, what's the change in the translational kinetic energy of the spring? <coughs> okay, just think about this spring. I'm holding a spring here. It's at rest. Here's my spring. What's the translational kinetic energy of the spring? Zero. Now I stretch it. What's the translational kinetic energy of the spring? Zero. zero. That's right. Okay. So that has to be zero. And let's see how that works out. So that's going to be at F net X times the displacement of the center of mass, which is equal to a minus 5 newtons plus 5 newtons times 0 meters, 0. 
So all of your work went into changing the energy of the system and not changing its translational kinetic energy. <coughs> Okay, so where did, so wh where did that work go? <coughs> Spring potential energy, yes? Okay. <coughs> we actually have a movie of the two puck situation. So let me see if I can find it. Here we have an equipment that's sort of like two pucks sliding on ice. What we really have are two heavy pulleys riding on two carts that will roll on these long aluminum tracks. One of them we're going to pull from the center one of them we're going to pull from the edge, wrapped around it. I've got them locked here for the moment so they don't move. You'll see that there are little yellow tags on here so that you can see how far the piece of string moves, in particular as it plays off this pulley as it moves. So these guys are going to move down here. What's moving them is the strings come down to pulleys, come up over these pulleys, come over those pulleys, and down to what's called an idler pulley, from which we'll hang a weight, which will then pull down. And this arrangement assures that the force in that string and the force in that string are exactly the same. So we've contrived a situation where we're applying the same force to both of these pucks, one pulled from the center, one pulled from the edge. And so we'll want to then see what happens to the motion of the pucks, and also to how the little tags on the strings move. What I'm going to do is I'm going to release both of these carts and the strings are going to pull and what's going to pull them, as we said, is that hanging weight down there at the end. So here I go, I'm going to let go now and you see the weight starting to fall, pulling on both of the carts. Here we have the, the two pucks. One can rotate, one can't. The, this one here is pulled from the center. This one is pulled from the edge with the string wrapped around it. We also have little plastic flags attached to the strings so you can see how those move. And uh, for the rotating one, some string is going to pay off this being wound around the edge. So that could move in a different way. Watch how the flags move and watch how the centers of the two pucks move. We're going to apply the same force to both and a release, and here we go. And you see that the pucks are moving together. The centers are moving together. Now eventually the weight hits the floor at the other end. But for this long motion here, the centers move together. The flags did not because they were pulling more string off the rotating puck, and that extra work went into making it rotate. Okay.